my name is Antti Kronov, uh, co-author Ansi Smedlund is in the audience there as well. And I'm a postdoc here at the University of Helsinki Faculty of Social Sciences. And I guess I'm in the uh, final stage of my postdoc career, more or less. And by a way of introduction, I'm going to advertise something that is actually not related with th this presentation at all. Because this is sort of the stuff that I mostly do nowadays is, is a project called Compon, Comparing Climate Change Policy Networks, where the idea is to look at the uh, relationship between political institutions, policy networks, and the actual policies being produced. In this case, they are related with climate change. Of course, this is a very hot topic, literally speaking. And we've, we've gathered uh, policy network surveys in several countries, in 14 all in all, I think, Finland, Sweden, US, India, Germany, Japan included. And this is actually a pretty unique data set. And I was just able to get additional funding, which means that we'll do a second round of surveys in a few countries, at least four. And we've also gathered some media data, which we analyzed with network techniques to some extent as well, with a method called discourse network analysis, or DNA, where agreement constitutes a link between policy actors, in, which is pro, uh, in the media. And in the future, future we also hope to gather some social ne uh, media data, Twitter mainly, and then we'll have the policy networks, which is sort of like the direct connections between policy actors as they report themselves. Then mediated connections in the so, uh, professional media and the social media. And then it's a sort of like a multi-layer network, which we can analyze with multi-layer uh, network techniques. And while doing so, of course, we'll also solve the problem of climate change. Uh, but currently, I'm actually on a parental leave. There's a proud, perhaps somewhat confused, older brother with a, with a baby boy who was born last Tuesday. So he's six days old today. And this is, of course, a very happy occasion. I'm not jet lagged, but I might certainly feel like I was. <laughs> and the other downside is that I can't join, join you for dinner tonight, or, and, and tomorrow I'll have to skip the whole day. But thanks for having me here anyway, and it's of course an uh, honor to speak in the same session as, as the esteemed Randall Collins. Congratulations. <laughs> thanks. But now that I have your full sympathies, I've shown you the baby picture, I can go on to the actual presentation. And we already touched upon the topic of network several times today, and Ron Bert was mentioned also. Ugo just dropped an egg. <laughs> and he's, of course, known for this theory of structural holes, where he thinks that uh, when brokers connect between structural holes, otherwise disconnected parts of the network, this is supposed to be a good thing for all sorts of innovative activities, creativity in a sense. Basically for the reason that the, the brokers receive non-redundant information. If, if you're in the tight click, everybody sort of, the so, same sort of information is supposed to s circulate in the network. And that's a bad thing. At least it's supposed to be. The, a somewhat competing view says that this may be true, but dense clicks of groups of people also produce good things. You need density for increasing trust, making coordination of action possible, and so forth. Well, can you have your cake and eat it too? This is in a way what David Stark has uh, said recently, or tr tried to argue. He thinks that, okay, structural holes, people filling, filling these structural holes may certainly receive new information. But uh, this is not really what uh, innovativeness is about. It's more about recombination, actually, just as we heard. And you can actually recombine old stuff only when you're part of cliques that fold into each other. This is what he argues. 
So this is a kind of like a combinatory theory of the benefits of density and social structures. And he also, also thinks it sort of logically follows that innovativeness actually is a property of groups, not of individuals. Because it's a property of these cliques or uh, network structures that fold into each other. What this means in, in practice is highlighted in this figure. On your left, you'll find a structural fold. And on your right, there's a structural hole. Or there's a node which brokers the connections. So on the right side, the node is not connected. Or it's connected with both sides of the network, but it's uh, by just one link. So it's not actually a, like a click member. Whereas on the left side, the node which, you, which is marked with red is, uh, means that the clicks, and click in this case, is a network where everybody is connected with each other. So that, that node who, who connects, if it's a person, connects those two clicks, is, is also connected with everybody else in the, in the networks. So it's a member of, of both clicks. And thus, the networks fold into each other. Well, why would that be beneficial for innovativeness? Well, Stark thinks that such groups that have these folds, they have a tendency, tendency to have or hold different things valuable. They value different sorts of things. And here is where he relies on this semi-famous book by Luke Boltanski and Laura Theveno on justification, which was originally published in French already, already in the 90s, 1990s, but uh, has only gained momentum in the English world, English-speaking English world in the in recent years, I think, or recent decade or so. And Boltanski and Theveno think that when there's disagreement about what is valuable, people tend to rely on maybe six or seven types of justifications. And they draw on like the history of philosophy and blah, blah, blah. Although it's a bit uh, uncertain whether these are really universal ways of justifying things or of, of holding things valuable. But that's what they think anyway. And they say that you have to have a, some sort of a basic agreement about what is valuable for, for example, for economic exchange to take place. And here is where Stark agrees, because he says that, no, actually, divergence, so you have different values, divergence of values or valuations can be a good thing, because it can generate new ideas. This means that there's uncertainty. And this is supposed to happen when these groups fold into each other, that they, they tend to hold the same thing valuable in, in each click, but when they, in a sense, collide by folding it into each other, then they're supposed to generate new ideas. Stark and people close to his group, they, I think they've shown so far by ethnographic data that indeed you can find divergence of valuations in, in different work organizations. For example, I think in the post-Soviet Hungary, he had a nice research done there. Some people have also done formal social network analysis where they show that groups with structural holds may be more innovative, innovative than others. But nobody has really actually shown that these three things would go together. Divergence of valuation, structural folds, and innovativeness. And this is, in a sense, what we set out to test. But there's an additional theoretical twist, because we think that it's not necessarily the case that they would go all together. Or they, in a way, do, but not in the way that Stark maybe thinks. And we present what, something that we call the compensatory mechanism between divergence of valuation and structural folding. And our idea is that folding of groups into each other may be beneficial for innovativeness, but it could be that it's actually compensating for the lack of uh, levels of 
high levels of divergence. So if there's a lot of groups with, that fold into each other, but still, in a way, value the same sort of stuff, then the folds are beneficial, and vice versa. So if there's a, there are groups that, that, that are, uh, this is confusing. <laughs> No, but the, the, uh, if you have high levels of divergence, then it could be actually that folding is not beneficial anymore. So if they go together, that's not necessarily a good thing for innovativeness. But if you have the other and, and not the other, then that's a good idea. Maybe uh, this is an idea that we have that it could be that it's simply too disruptive for the groups if there are just a lot of this folding takes place and then at the same time valuations collide. It might be too difficult to get anything done innovatively. And we also test, test for this simple idea of, of structural folding while testing for our additional theoretical twist which means that we test whether folds increase divergence of valuation in groups and whether divergence of valuation increases innovativeness. The data is from a professional service firm in Finland. So this is a, just one single firm. Of course, this is an obvious limitation of the study. We did an online survey where we ask for their advice networks, or where do we get advice? And of course, that's, a, that's the link. Again, might be a limitation of the study. It's an advice network and, and not something else. We operationalize these worlds of valuation that, that, uh, that Poltanski and Theveno uh, outline in their theory in this survey. And we measure innovativeness by using this scaled scale of exploration versus exploitation where you, it's not a self-report, but it's actually the supervisors who report whether somebody who works under you is better at uh, generating new ideas and practices or like implementing old stuff. And there's also like a middle point, point which is nowadays called ambidexterity, I think, in the literature, which means that you're uh, as good in both. Again, this might, may be, of course, a, a limitation of the study that the way in which innovativeness is measured here. Is this what creativity is about? I'm not sure. And this is not really about creativity in the arts and sciences either, so please accept my apologies. <laughs> and the end is like around 150 people, but what we actually analyze is 280 clicks of 104 employees. And innovativeness is measured uh, at the group level in this case, we basically aggregate the individual measures. Clicks were identified with click overlap analysis or, or with UCI net click analysis and then we check for their ob overlaps. If clicks have a lot of overlaps in our analysis, that means that they uh, have a lot of structural faults. The actual analysis was just a linear regression and we did a two-way interaction model and, and a simple slope analysis of, of, of the interaction as well. Just to summarize the variables that were used, as I said, group, it's group innovativeness is the aggregate of individual innovative ratings as reported by the supervisors. Everything else is reported by the, the employees, like where do you get the advice. It's not the supervisor saying that that, one, that person gets advice from him or her. That's something that they self-report. And the independent variables, folding is number of overlaps each click has, divergence of valuation is how uh, the, uh, the, the differences in, in these things that the click members value, how different they are from each other. And we do have some controls as well. The results regarding our theoretical addition show that things seem to work the way we argued that they would, which is nice. So if both folding and divergent valuation go together, 
it means that actually you find lower levels of innovativeness. Uh, folding may be a good thing, but only indeed with when there's not too much of divergence of valuation. Uh, re results regarding the, 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 the original theory of structural folding, we find that uh, folding may actually do, it may increase innovativeness and also divergence of valuation, but not, not by that much. But divergence of valuation as such doesn't seem to increase innovativeness in our data. It is indeed only with low levels of structural folding. So it, in a sense, compensates, compensates for the lack of structural folding. Uh, this is an illustration of the effect. We have three categories here, the different lines. Uh, blue one is low levels of structural folds. The middle line is medium levels. And the red line, which goes like this, is, is high levels of structural folds. And then on the y-axis, you find innovativeness or exploration in this case, which is the same thing as innovativeness in our research. And on the x-axis, you have divergence of valuation. And what you see here is that when there's a low, low level of, of folds and divergence of valuation increases, that also increases innovativeness. It goes like this. But it's the other way if you have a high level of folds. Divergence of valuation increases, innovativeness goes down. This is just an illustration. And this uh, table also summarizes in a, <laughs> a very simple manner what we're saying here. So the pluses mean that good thing for innovativeness. When high divergence of valuation is combined with low levels of folding and, and vice versa. So our interpretation for these results that it, it is that maybe it is simply too disruptive for for these work groups to have both, if you may call it social-based and value-based mixing at the same time. Could be a practical implication, but of course this is pure speculation. I must admit that it's not necessarily always a good thing to force very different people into like these work teams. At least if they are like, if they interact a lot with other teams, which is basically basically what this folding is about. But we need, of course, more research to, to actually prove this. But this, because this is indeed the first research which looks at all of these things together, folding, divergence of valuation, and in innovativeness. It's also the first time that the theory of Poltansky and Theveno has been operationalized in a survey, as far as I know. And I think we do present the theoretical addition, which is somewhat original, this compensatory mechanism idea. But of course, this research has limitations, as all research does. It's a single firm, and it's a, although I think that it's a, a good thing that we, we are the first ones to test this, these things together and to opera, operationalize the theory of Poltansky and Theveno, of course, that may be a problem as well, because we can't rely on previous measures to really test these ideas. And you can always say that they should be measured in some other way. But then, then again, of course, that also means that we need more research. So please go and replicate the finding, or I can do it if you give me the funding. <laughs> and. Uh, to end, I thank you and show you yet again another baby picture, so you'll be sympathetic in your comments. Thank you.